I invite you to open a Bible to Ephesians chapter 1. Over the next several weeks, we are going through just the first three chapters of Ephesians and studying what God's Word says about grace. This wonderful word that we're all familiar with, that we just sung a wonderful hymn about, and that we celebrate and enjoy, but sometimes we forget just how expansive and amazing His grace and His love for us really is. And the reason we're just doing the, the first half of Ephesians is because in these three chapters, there's not a single command, there's not a single imperative of something that we are demanded by God's word or commanded by Paul to do. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we think, well, in order to maintain God's love, maintain my hope in God, maintain my salvation, whatever it might be, we think we have to keep doing and keep doing and keep going and keep going. And the beauty of the gospel, the, the amazing grace of God's love for us is that it's already done. It's already completed, not just in the past, but also for our future. And so this morning, as we dive into God's word, we're going to be looking at this word hope. And it shows up over 80 times in the New Testament. The Greek word is elpis, and it just, we translate it every single time it shows up as hope. And hope is a wonderful word. It's a wonderful word. But our English version of hope really stinks. <laughs> okay? Because a lot of times when we say hope in English, it's, it's almost like wishful thinking, right? It, it's, there's this level of uncertainty when we say, I hope this will happen. So if you have a job interview or a college application or you're auditioning for a sports team or a music group, whatever it might be, you're trying for something new in life and then you, and you're asking for prayers and everything, someone will say or you will say to yourself, well, I'm really hopeful or it, it went well or the conversation will, and I'm hoping for a certain outcome. And what do you mean by that? You're semi-positive, right? Like, like, it might happen. Things are going well. But you're saying, I'm hoping because of what? You're a little unsure that it's 100%, right? I, I'm just not positive it's going to happen. So we do it with positive things. Sometimes we do it with uh, difficult or hardship things. If someone we love is ill or they're going through a hard time, we are hoping for what? They'll be healed, they'll get better, or things will change for them. And we'll work really hard at it, and we'll encourage people, we'll pray for them. But when we say hope, we're like, yeah, it could happen. That would be amazing, but I'm not so sure. But in the New Testament, in the Bible, hope is totally different. Hope in the Bible is not just, I hope it's true, I hope it happens, or there's a good chance of it happening, but I got to make, you know, there's a little uncertainty. Hope in the Bible is always this, it's this life-shaping certainty. Like, it, it changed, when B Bible talks about hope, when Paul talks about hope, it's not this uncertainty of, I think Jesus will do this. I think God will accomplish this. It's always written as this idea of it's so certain that it's going to happen in the future we can live in the presence as if it has happened right i know that's fun grammar right but the idea in the bible of hope that paul talks about and the authors in the old testament new testament talk about is that it is so certain that god is going to do this thing in the future for us that god will keep his word that God will keep his promise for us. We can live now in the present as if it's already happened for us. And if you have that kind of hope about the future, it changes the way you live here and now. Right? It actually frees you to enjoy God's grace. Because if we have the, the messed up human version of hope, which is, I think it's there, I'm 90% I'm positive, right? Anybody ever done that? Like you start putting percentages on how hopeful you are on things? Like I'm 99% sure, but just in case, it might not work out, right? What happens when you and I treat God's grace and God's love for you and me in Jesus Christ that way? It affects how we live. Because if I'm only 99% certain 
that God's gonna keep his promise for me in the future. I'm going to literally kill myself and burden myself and wear myself thin and wear myself out and overwhelm myself to do what? To take care of that 1%, right? I gotta make sure he's gonna keep loving me. I gotta make sure he's gonna approve of me in the future so much that he will keep his promise. And so when we think that way, which is kind of the default of how our hearts work, we get onto this never-ending, exhausting treadmill of effort of doing more and doing more, making sure that I'll cover that last percentage, Jesus. Don't you worry. But what Paul talks about when he talks about hope, not just in this text, but throughout the New Testament, he's saying, no, it's so certain, it's so guaranteed for you, you can live here and now as if it's already happened for you. There's no, well, I'm hoping, but there's no percentage on it. There's no, like, I gotta give a little more effort just to make sure it does come through. No, it's a sure and certain promise that is very real for you and me here and now. Now, we're talking about grace, and we're talking about hope. And last week, I asked you how many of you were good Lutherans. We had a good showing of hands, and the rest of you admitted you're like mediocre Lutherans, and that's okay. So here we have these two words. How many of you have heard the words hope and grace in church a bajillion times, right? And what happens is I hear those words so many times, guess what we do? You either fall asleep or roll your eyes during the sermon going, yeah, I've heard about that. I know about, I know about grace. I know about hope. Right? Christmas is only like six months away. Start panicking, okay? <laughs> like, right? That's all about hope, right? So it's like we know as Christians, like, I know about hope. I know about God's grace. Give me something new. But here's the problem that Paul's addressing is we can know something in our heads. Like, you could give me a definition of grace after service, right? You could give me hope of what it means to you after church. But sometimes we, we forget it in our hearts. And here's what I mean by that is in the Bible, the heart was the seat of your whole life, the world, the, the thing that drove all of your decision making, the way you live in your heart and all of your emotions were in your gut. So if you ever hear the expression, I got a gut feeling about something, it's from the Bible, okay? You just didn't know it, right? But in our day and age, like, we don't think that way, like, our mind, right? Our mind's making all my decisions and it's guiding me in all these things. So I have a friend who says, it's a long way from the head to the heart, right? Meaning, my brain, you can know the definition of grace, you can know a definition of hope, you can tell me, I've heard it all before, but you can forget to live with that hope in your heart. You can forget how to allow it to shape your whole life and the way you move forward and decisions. And this is what Paul is talking about. He's talking to the church. In verse 6, it says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayer. So this paragraph is a prayer from Paul for the church. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened. So he's saying, look, he's writing to the church. and He's saying, look, I, I know about you. I know you love Jesus. I know you know about Jesus. I know you love the church and are serving him. Paul was in Ephesus when the church got started. So he knows that they're well aware of the facts. In fact, in Revelation, when Jesus writes to Ephesus, one of the things that he has against them is he's like, you know all the doctrine, but you forgot your first love, which was a passionate love for Jesus. Basically telling them, you know all the right answers. You would pass confirmation with flying colors. You would know all the questions in the catechism, and yet you're lacking a heartfelt love for Jesus. So what Paul is telling to the church in Ephesus here is saying, I know all about you. I give thanks to God that you, that you know Jesus, that you care about the church, and that you have wisdom. But here's what I'm praying for you, that you'd also have the eyes of your heart opened up, that you would be able to see who Jesus is and what God has done for you, not just with 
I know it on the fact sheet, but I, I know it with my very being. I trust it. I trust in him, him and his promises with my very being, and it shapes and changes how I view the world and how I live. So he's saying all these wonderful things, and here is his prayer request, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. So what Paul is praying is for the church, for the saints, which is you and me, anybody that believes in Jesus is a saint, even if you don't feel like a saint. He's saying, here's what I want you to know. I want you to know the hope of Jesus. You say, oh, I already know that. But we often forget, right? If you've ever driven yourself to exhaustion trying to do more, if you've ever been riddled by guilt and now you're trying to make up for it, right? If you've ever felt shame and you're trying to cover it up rather than seeking forgiveness, that is you and me in our practical lives forgetting about the hope we have in Jesus. So Paul's gonna tell us three things about what hope is, right? Three things that are w about biblical hope that are way better than, eh, you know, could happen, could not happen. If it does, it's gonna be really awesome, right? That's a weak hope. That's the hope that we talk about in the world, but the hope of Jesus, the hope of the Bible is so much better. So three things that I want us to learn about hope. The first is that it's grounded in reality. Right, so if you're taking notes, just write the word grounded down. Right, it is grounded in a real event, real history. Right, and the reason that's so important is that it makes it real. It makes it so it's not flimsy. It has a solid foundation. Right, again, when we usually think of hope and we're putting percentages on it or we're feeling a little uncertain, why is that? Because we're kind of like, I don't know if it's going to happen. I don't have any guarantees that it's gonna happen, right? But when Paul says, I want you to know the hope has called you. It's past tense. The grammar matters. I know, grammar school is not exciting, but the grammar matters. It's, it's past tense. He's already called you to it. And the first part of chapter one, what we talked about last week, is that hope that he has called us to, which is that before the foundations of the world, before we ever did anything right or wrong, he already chose to save you and redeem you and love you in Christ Jesus. See, our hope is not grounded in ourselves. It's not, you know, this flimsy thing. It's grounded in the work that God has already done in Jesus on the cross. Martin Luther often talked about remembering our baptism every day, which I don't know if any of you do that, but you, just, you, know, you sprinkle water on you, you, remember, you say the words, you remember your baptism every day. And the whole reason he said that was as a pastoral encouragement to anybody struggling with sin, which is probably 99% of you, okay? Maybe a little bit more than that. Right? We, we all struggle with sin, which creeps in, and we begin to forget the hope that we've already been called to. And so he told his church to remember their baptism because baptism is God's work outside of you. It's a reminder that God's grace is done by him for you. It's not something you do yourself. And so when Paul says, I want you to remember what he's already called you into, He's saying it's past tense, he's already done it. So you don't have to like, I, got, I hope I get in. <laughs> like, I, I hope he's gonna love me and welcome me. Paul's saying, no, no, the reason you and I have hope is because he's already done that. And it's a work outside of yourself. So put it another way, if you're ever wondering, does God love me, do I have hope in him? The answer is, what did he do on the cross? Well, Jesus died, what did Jesus die for? Sinners, what are you? A sinner. And so I can have a grounded hope that is grounded in reality that doesn't depend on how I'm feeling or how things are going, but it depends solely on what Jesus has already done for me. And Paul says, this is what I want you to remember. Here's my prayer for you. Do you remember that he's already called you? He's already done it for you. The next is that it's a personal hope. So anybody ever hear the word saints? And I know I've tried to emphasize this every time it comes up in our 
Bible classes and the sermon text, whatever it might be, but we hear the word saint, it's in the Bible, be honest, how often do you go, that ain't me, right? Anybody just like, that's not saints, that's the good people at Ephesus. Where's the letter for the other people like me at that church, right? Our default view of ourselves is, well, I'm not a saint. That, that is about somebody who's better than me, somebody who's closer to God than me. But here's the deal. Paul is going to make it a personal hope. It's not just for the really good Christians. It's not just for the really holy people that we think are really close to God and do an amazing job. It's for all the saints. So he says, I want you to know the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And the word saints is the hagios, the, the holy ones, meaning it's everybody that's in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so if you have the Holy Spirit, you believe in Jesus, whether you've been doing a great job job of it or not, you are biblically called a saint. It's Paul's term for the church, for the people of God. So this is a personal hope. It's a hope for who? The saints, which is you and me and every other Christian. And I want you to hear what he says, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. So last week, the inheritance was ours because we have an inheritance of eternal life guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. Now Paul's talking about the glorious inheritance that belongs to God, right? So God's going to get an inheritance that is won for him by Jesus. And here is how much God loves you and treasures you. Here is how God sees you. The inheritance, according to Paul, is the saints. So think about that. What God's treasuring out of all creation, what God is looking forward to having as his possession for all eternity, get ready to be shocked, is you. That's what it says. That the hope that we have is that we are so treasured and loved by God that he is going to possess us for all eternity. That we are his inheritance. That means we belong to him. Now just think about how wonderful that grace sounds. When you and I look at our life, you're like, really? Like the Lord's gonna be, oh, here they come when he sees me. And yeah, that's the beauty of it. Paul's saying you are his inheritance. You are the treasure. You are the possession that he is looking forward to enjoying and receiving for all eternity. That's a wonderfully personalized hope. You say, well, you're really bad. You're like, yeah, I am. You're like, you're like the worst saint we've ever had. Like, you don't even make the team. I'm like, yeah, but I made God's team, so here I am. That's amazing. Talk about, see, this is what it means when the Bible talks about hope is that it changes our, the whole way we live and see ourselves and see the world. Rather than getting trapped into Satan's lies and attacks, or saying you're worthless, you're not worthy, you're not good enough, you're not lovable, you're not wanted, we have a hope that says the exact opposite. That no, yeah, right. Like I could be a, a terrible sinner, right? I could be coming up short. I could be making mistakes and doing the wrong things. And yet, the hope of the gospel is that you and I belong to God forever. The hope and the good news of the gospel is that it's so personal that when he looks at you, he says, that is my beloved treasure that I am looking forward to with joy at possessing forever. This is why when Peter writes in his letters, he says, you are our, a treasured possession that you and I were bought at a price. Here's why that's such good news, hope. It means you and I belong to God forever. You, right now, are a treasured possession that belongs to God for all eternity. And he has joy about it. And he's looking forward to it. And so no matter 
how you are feeling, what the ups and downs of life are, no matter how well you feel like you are behaving as a saint, the hope that you and I have is that we belong to God because he treasures us and he loves us and he has redeemed us in Christ, not because I'm doing a really good job and staying on his list. No, it's simply because he treasures you and loves you. All right, the third thing about hope is that it's material, all right? It's not, it, it's, a, it's a physical, material, real-world hope. Oftentimes when we think of hope in our terrible, worldly, human sense, it's, it's like a fantasy, right? Well, I hope this thing happens, right? It's an idea, it's a dream. The hope that we have as Christians, the hope that is talked about in Scripture, is a material hope. It's meant for our real lives. And so after talking about us being his inheritance, verse 19, Paul says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead? So what Paul is saying is, here's the, the third piece of hope that I want you to understand, that God's power as at work in you and me here and now, and the same power that is at work in you and me is the power that he used to raise Jesus from the dead. Right, so that creates for you and I a living hope, a hope that I can actually trust for here and now, that when I go to God in prayer, it's not an empty, wishy-washy thing. I'm like, you know, if you could get around to it, Lord, amen. Anybody ever prayed that way? I know I have. Where you're like, you start off really bold, like, here's what I want, Lord. And then by the end of it, you're like, you know, if you have time, if it's not too difficult for you, don't worry about it. Never mind, I'll take care of it. Amen. Don't lie to me right now. I know some of you have prayed that way because <laughs> we default to that. Because we forget that we have a, 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 an actual living hope for the real world and the real life here and now. And you're like, Pastor, how do you know that? Because God's word just said that the power that raised Jesus from the dead and then seated him on the throne of heaven and the whole universe is working in the saints right now. Is working in those who believe in Jesus here and now. So would you and I place our hope in God and we are trusting him, and we are asking him to do a work in our lives. It's not, you know, a 99%, nah, maybe he'll get around to it. There's no percentage on it. He's just saying, no, no. The power that raised Christ from the dead is at work in the church now. So if that's true, it changes how we view the world. It changes what fears and anxieties we might have. And instead of go, why should I fear that? Why should I worry about that? Why should I have anxiety about it? Why should I be overwhelmed by that? Because I know and I have a hope that it's the power of God that raised Christ from the dead and seated him on the throne of heaven is at work in the church here and now. So here's what that means for you and I, is that you and I have a real hope. Not an uncertain hope, not a we hope, we're, we're wishing it gets that way. But we have a guarantee that Christ is at work here and now. We have a guarantee that our hope rests on what he did in the past. And we have a guarantee that in the future we're still going to belong to God. So what Paul is saying is here's your hope in Jesus. Here's what it looks like. It covers all of your existence. It covers your past. It covers the, your present, that God is still at work here and now in the saints, in the church, and it covers your future, saying, no, you belong to him. You are his possession. He is going to inherit you. He's not going to let you go. And so the hope that we have as Christians covers our whole lives, every aspect of it, every time of it, and even the uncertain parts of the future. You can say, yeah, but I, I have a hope that rests on God. You see, the ultimate beauty of all this hope is that it depends on Jesus. If you were reading and listening carefully, everything that Paul said centered on Jesus. 
It's centered on what Jesus has done for us. That's the hope that we've been called to. And it centers on the fact that Jesus is the one that makes us a possession that belongs to God for his inheritance. And it centers on Christ that through his death, resurrection, and ascension, that he is seated on the throne of heaven, that his power is alive and at work in us. So we have this hope. And at the end of the day, here's the easy way to remember it. It's the Sunday school answer to all Bible questions. Well, how do I know I have hope? It's Jesus. Well, how do I know? And I'm going to give you a Bible verse. It's one of my favorites. How do I know that it's actually for me and not just the good saints? So here's the reality. You are a holy one according to God. You are perfect perfectly and totally and completely forgiven and redeemed by Jesus. The Holy Spirit dwells in you, and he has made you holy in the eyes of God, meaning you are a saint, you belong to him. But I do know the reality of life is that we get beat up sometimes, and there are days where you're going to come into church, and there's days you're going to wake up in your house, and you're going to go, I don't feel like a saint today. And on those days, we're going to struggle with how do I know it's actually a hope and a promise that's for me and not just them? So here's a Bible verse for you to hold on to. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. That is why through him we say our amens to God for his glory. So how do you know, oh no, this living hope that is for your past, your present, and your eternal future is for you? How do you know that the promises of God are actually for you even when you don't feel like a saint? Is because the answer, according to God's word, is that all the promises of God, all of them, find their yes in Jesus. So if you have Jesus, if you trust in him, even if it's, you feel like it's only the size of a mustard seed kind of faith, the Bible says you have all the promises of God for you because they find their yes in Jesus, and you and I have Jesus. And I love what Paul says because oftentimes our hope gets lived out in how we pray, right? I'm hoping in God, so I'm going to pray for things in life. So he says, because all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus, that is why through him we say our amen to the glory of God. Yeah, I get to say amen at the end of any of my prayers because I have Jesus. And because I have Jesus, I have all the promises of God. So even if you're not feeling like a saint today or tomorrow or next week, maybe you're just not feeling it for a whole season, Maybe you feel like all I've got is faith the size of a mustard seed. The good news is you have a Savior who is much bigger than all of that. And because of that that Savior, Jesus, you have all the promises of God. So you and I can actually go to him with all the hope in the world. And at the end of that ridiculous, bold, amazing, big prayer that you have in your heart, you could confidently say, yeah, I can say amen, because Jesus keeps his promises. I want to share one last uh, verse with you. There are a lot of benedictions. I know I say one at the end of the service, right? There's actually a lot of them in your Bible. So I'm going to share with you my favorite one. All right. Romans chapter 15, verse 13, St. Paul writes, May the God of hope, right, God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that because of you, we have hope. Hope that our past has been forgiven. Hope that you are alive and working here and now in our present lives. And a hope that we will have eternal life with you and the Heavenly Father forever and ever. Help us in this life, Lord, to hold on to that good news. To hold on to that hope and trust in all of your promises that we have because of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.